thank you for joining us. I'm Charlene Sinjenko, and today is the official launch of Region Impact Media. We are having four panels throughout the day, and I am lucky enough to host this panel here at noon Pacific time. I want to acknowledge that I am hosting from the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Squamish First Nations here on the beautiful Sunshine Coast. And the name of this panel or this conversation is Shifting the, Shifting the Narrative Through Film. And we're talking all day today about the power of media is in our hands. So welcome and thank you for joining us. I'm gonna do a quick round of introductions to the artists and filmmakers that are joining us today in conversation and deep gratitude for uh, all of you for joining. I'm gonna start over with Catherine Eaton. Catherine is a writer, director, and actor in the feature film, The Sounding. I'm going to describe her as a collective genius explorer. And uh, she is also a theatrical performer of both Irish classical theater, as well as performing at Carnegie Hall. Welcome, Catherine, and thank you for joining us. Thank you so I much, Charlotte. I will move over to Deanne Whalen. Uh, Deanne is an award-winning documentary filmmaker. She's the first person to complete the coast-to-coast -coast epic waterway and land traverse in its entirety. It's the longest uh, recreational trail in the world, known as the Trans-Canada Trail. She's also filmed on the most northern coastline of Canada, and she is always exploring the inclusive story that will carry us all into the world, into the future of our world. Welcome, Dee. And I'll jump over to Naomi McDougall-Jones. Naomi is an award-winning storyteller, change maker, and future weaver. She's an ecosystem builder, a co-founder of the 51 Fund. Naomi has been a vocal advocate for bringing parody to film both on and off screen. She has spoken at film festivals and conferences around the world. You have probably seen her TED Talk and she's also written extensively on this subject. Thank you for being here, Naomi. And Maya Olmsted is a, an artist, a builder, a change maker, a disruptor. She has been a field-based citizen scientist focused on our oceans for over 40 years, and she's logged more than 5,700 hours underwater. She's an internationally accomplished underwater photographer and cinematographer. Maya is deeply committed to energetic partnerships as a key ingredient in reimagining re a new economy. Thank you for being here, Maya. And I would love to uh, welcome uh, my sister, Echo Ellick, uh, digital disruptor. Echo is trained in digital media. She's a performing artist who specializes in the creation of safe spaces to empower sacred creativity. She works through the disciplines of singing, spoken word, rap, writing, speaking, music, sound, film, and sacred space, empowerment facilitation, with a career dedicated to empowering the next generation through culture and art. Thank you for being here, Echo. So we're gonna dive into our first circle because I very much want each of these incredible artists to share a little more about who they are. Those are very short bios. And in this opening circle, I would love for you to explore and answer the question, this, this sentence that's written across the screen, the power of media is in our hands. What does that mean to you and who you are as an artist and filmmaker in 2020? And uh, if I could, Naomi, I'm gonna ask you to kick off this circle. Sure, um, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here with all of you. Um, so I guess I think about this in three ways and I promise this will be a quick answer even though there are three, three parts. Um, and I do always think about it both as a storyteller myself and as 
Shar said is sort of an ecosystems builder thinking about it at a systems level. So as a, as a storyteller thinking about the power of media, I think about how um, primal story is. We, we don't think about this a lot now because it story has been commodified and commercialized and it's sort of the thing you turn on at the end of a hard day. But the reality is that there's never been a, a human society anywhere on earth or in history that didn't have storytelling at its center, whether that was um, through mythology or religion or um, you know Hollywood or <laughs> any other medium. Um, and so I think we have to think about what that means. Why do we do that? It's such an odd thing for a species to do, to spend a lot of time making up things and telling them to each other. And so I think that points to its critical importance to consciousness and to society. It's the, it's actually the framework by which we build a society and then hang everything else on, on it. Um, so when I think about the power of media, I think about the social responsibility of those who are storytellers. And in many other cultures, storytellers have um, sort of a sacred role and duty within a community. And um, at the moment, we have a lot of broken people <laughs> seeking fame and um, money and these things and, and have forgotten what the responsibility of that job is to a society, the role of service that it is. Um, and then I also think about the power of media is in our hands in the sense that um, no one's coming to save us. It's in our hands to change the narrative. Um, we're at a time of the, the greatest mass consolidation of media companies that has ever existed on planet Earth. There's essentially five corporations now that are deciding what everybody watches. And I think that's a really big problem. And these corporations are incentivized by profits at a unprecedented scale, not again in service to society, not as social responsibility. Um, and no one's coming to save us from those corporations. <laughs> we, 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 the power of media is in our hands. It is our job to figure out how to take story back from that machine um, for the health of our society. Wow, I'm so glad I kicked it off with you. <laughs> oh my goodness. Dee, this is, uh, story has been a part of your life for a very long time. And I'm, I'm curious with, coming off a six year journey, spending time on your own in nature, and now writing your book and starting to work on, on 500 Days in the Wild, like where does this take you? Well, first of all, it was a, um, like Naomi said, I'm honored to be here amongst all of you. And Catherine, I've been wanting to see your picture for a long time. It's really nice to get eyes on you as well. Um, I've had the honor of meeting Echo, and Naomi, and Maya, and so it's nice to meet you. Uh, for me, uh, the power of media is in our hands. is like saying the power of story is in our hands. And I would say that there's both a personal uh, and a public expression of that. Just as we know that we can, the way that we change our personal lives is to change our personal narrative. What's the story you want to tell? Do you want to focus on all the bad things that have happened to you? Or do you want to focus on all the positive things that have happened to you? What is the story that you want to tell when you meet somebody? Who are you? Who, what is that story that you are telling? And one of the most empowering things on any healing journey is the re realization that I just, I got to be right my story, you know? And I would say that what's true for the microcosm is true for the macrocosm. The power of media in our hands is the power of story in our hands. We, what story do we want to write? And as Naomi said, you know, we, we've always shared a lens through which we view the world through. The beautiful thing about cultural diversity is that there are so many lenses. And now is an incredible opportunity to learn from one another. And certainly where I found my hope on this journey was through the lens of just learning from kindergarten, really perspective, an indigenous perspective on uh, our relationship with the earth. Uh, that is where I found my hope because it's, it's where sustainability lies. It's living with. So I see the power of this collective as bringing storytellers together from different lenses so that we can listen to one another, learn from one another, Another power to heal collectively is just the same as the power to heal each of our own selves, right? And that is to take control of the narrative. You know, don't answer the questions, ask the questions. 
you know, and um, never lose. I think as women too, you know, we bring the circle back. When we learn stories, it's always a line. And what we learn is, you know, what we know as women is the circle, the connection of everything. And I would say that right now that circle is broken. We have a collective story. Really the ultimate ambition of a collective story is survival. And right now we don't have a story that's based on that, that will bring that outcome. Um, we have lost. And again, you know, we've lost that connection to thinking uh, about seven generations. We're making decisions thinking about tomorrow's stock price. That's a problem. So yeah, I see great hope um, and uh, in taking the power of the story back into our own hands. And that's to me what this is all about. Echo, I'm going to swing over over to you, and and the reason being, obviously, the thread of, of some of the things that Dee is saying. But one of the um, experiences that I have with you as a as a, a storyteller um, is actually holding very sacred space where we we are artists, creatives, change makers have have done some vision boarding work, and not only those incredibly sacred spaces where we're visioning our, our year and our future, but also um, in Echo's work with, with youth, and particularly Indigenous youth, as, as sacred creatives. And I'm very curious how those pieces are coming together and what, what's kind of coming through for you now in terms of the power of media is in our hands. Thank you, Shar. It's an honor to be here with all of you. Um, so the ways that my ancestors operated is they were in an abundant relationship, a reciprocal relationship with the land. They understood everything around them. They understood the seasons, the cycles, that everything came in that circle more, I guess, more like a spiral, right? Like every time around, there's a new lesson, there's a new something we're picking up, there's a new tool, there's new information. So everything we are surrounded by in the natural world is either medicine, tools, or technology. I take that same information and apply that into everything that I am working towards now. Uh, what would they do? What would my ancestors do if they were here in this time and had access to all of the, the things that we have access to, access to the media that we have access to? Everything around us is either medicine, tools, or technology. What is the medicine I'm teaching? What are the tools I need around me? And what is the technology I'm going to use to translate that message to our modern times? Um, so that teaching uh, is implemented into the ways that I work with youth, the ways that I connect and communicate with people, uh, the ways that I am seeing ancient stories bridging with modern technologies. Everything around us is either medicine, tools, or te technology. And what would they do if they were here? They would be sharing stories the same way I am sharing stories now. They would not fit into one industry. I've refused. <laughs> I have absolutely refused to fit in as a music producer or as an audio engineer or as a filmmaker because I've never felt like I fit. I'm too sparkly star-shaped to fit into one single kind of category. So I'm weaving together all of those tools to bridge the worlds and share stories that come from the land, sharing land-based frameworks through modern technology, through modern techniques, through modern tools. Um, and this has given me so much freedom to empower our next generations to know that they can do whatever they want with their life they can share whatever stories they want starting now. Use your phone. Use your phone and tell your own story. Start today. You do not have to run to school. You do not have to go through the system to fit into any one industry. The media is literally in our hands now. Uh, and all of the tools are accessible around us immediately. It's amazing, 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 amazing. Uh, I have witnessed some of our young people be able to share the depths of their trauma and their history through these medicines, through ways of communicating, 
Um, sometimes they are afraid to do it in person, but they will do it through a phone. They will do it through a screen so that they can hide their face and just share their voice. That's the power of the technology that, that we hold right now. So it literally is in our hands. And it's really, really exciting when I'm looking at bridging that those ancient teachings with what we have today to work with. Thank you. Uh, Maya, I'm coming over to you because the, the segue between youth and young people, as well as technology, um, I'm, I'm really curious where this takes you now. Well, um, number one, Echo, you and I definitely have this sort of soul sister relationship around really uh, empowering youth voices for sure. Uh, I think that for me, I kind of really want to go back to sort of this conversation of what media is, right? I, um, I'm not clear on whether this is just um, something that I'm thinking about because when I start to think about creating stories, I immediately think about the ocean. And I think about the fact that when the water is surrounding me and I'm immersed in the water, I'm immersed in the middle of the story, right? So the story slips in through my hands, it surrounds my body, it touches my skin, I can smell it. Um, I can feel it in a, a visceral way. And I think that's what children do. And frankly, I, I think that's what aunties and mothers and grandmothers do as well. I, I think this is why we talk so much about food because it's a very <laughs> tactile uh, dynamic experience. And we think of media now today as being a kind of film and we talk about digital media but it was not that long ago when media was a flip book, uh, where it was a written uh, ink and a quill. I don't even think that we understand what media is going to be anytime in the next 10, 15, 20 years. So I think the power is in that capacity for imagination and for believing in the magic of storytelling using any material that you can to bring that story to life and to give it your voice, but to blend your voice in with the environment and with those who've come before us and then to make it accessible to those who will go after us as well. Thank you. Catherine, where this takes me and in how I know you so far is, I, I'm curious when you think back to your theatrical performances, um, where you're literally sharing a story through the, the vessel of your, you know, your body and your voice on a stage and, and then how that kind of um, then kind of transferred into your work as a, a filmmaker, an actor, a director on, on your feature film. I'm really curious where this now takes you tying up this first, this first round, the power of media is in our hands. Uh, that's a great question. You guys, your just thoughts are super inspiring. I don't know if anyone else is out there listening, but I am seriously listening. So thank you so much. Um, I, yeah, so I fell in love with storytelling through my body, right? Through acting on the stage and living inside the story. Like you were talking about Maya being inside the ocean. That's uh, the way you described that is how it feels to me to be in the middle of a performance. It really is complete surrender, a recognition of humility, um, a kind of uh, a connection, a connectivity that uh, is hard to experience in other places for me because I think of the theater as being quite sacred actually. Um, and that's what made me fall in love with storytelling. And then I moved into directing and writing and acting on screen, which opened up a whole different world and has been extraordinary um, in that it's allowed me to um, kind of understand the bigger picture and some of the ecosystems that Naomi was talking about. Um, but also uh, just to recognize that theater, which isn't accessible to everyone or doesn't appear to be accessible to everyone, isn't the only option, right? There's a million ways to tell a story. And I think it really is important to talk about that word media, right? Because for me, that word was very much a gate 
for me for a long time. I didn't think, I thought, okay, theater, I understand it's paint and it's costumes and it's human beings and it's sweat and it's blood. And you can, you touch each other and, and your voice touches the audience. But when I got to the idea of film or TV, that sense of media and technology, I didn't see the medicine in it that Echo was talking about just now, which so beautifully. Um, and, and I think it's really important to remember that it just means channels of communication. That's all media means, right? It doesn't have to be technology. It can be spoken word. It can be, it can be done through a touch, right? It's just channels of communication that are collectively regarded, right? So they're shared. So I just think of media at this point as being shared storytelling. And I think that understanding that the power of that sh shared storytelling, storytelling stories that are shared and, and catch fire and become these sort of beacons in people's imagination, understanding that that's both ours literally, the way that Echo was talking about, right? We have all kinds of options in Maya as well of, um, and using the imagination that Dee was talking about, right, to put things on a phone, put things, write them down, put them on TikTok, wherever they go, you know, scratch them into the earth. That's, it's literally in our hands, the tools, but there's also, it's also figuratively in our hands in that there is responsibility that comes with that. And that's something that Naomi was talking about. And I think that we talk a lot about the responsibility of what's in those stories. And that's really important and a really important conversation. But a conversation we don't have that often is the responsibility just to tell the stories, right? That we, I want people listening, I want everyone here to be telling their story because I want to be the recipient of those stories as well. And I think we think of responsibility, or I'll say I have thought of responsibility for most of my life as being a noble burden, right? But recently I've been reinvestigating what responsibility really is. And there's a definition, it's one of the definitions, common definitions of responsibility that I love, which is the ability to act independently and make decisions without authorization. The ability to act independently and make decisions without authorization. That means responsibility is choice, right? It just gives us choice. So if, when I think of the power of media is in our hands, I think the power of shared storytelling is ours to choose who tells it, how it gets told, when it gets told, if we're the tellers. Love that. What a great, great segue to our next question. Um, I, I love where we landed in terms of really what it boils down to is opening up the waterways, opening up the waterways of accessibility, of choice to tell and share and listen and hear stories. And really that is a, a big, big part of what Regen Media is all about. Um, just setting out to be um, an intermediary between the stories that, that are wanting to be told and what they need to, to come to life. Just opening up those channels. Um, I'm very curious, I, I think folks probably want to know a little bit more about each of you before we, you know, before we dive any further, um, about what is going on in your own lives right now in, in, in this context? What are the projects? What, what's showing up for you right now? What most has your attention? Recognizing recognizing the responsibility, recognizing where we're at in time, recognizing, curious what comes up for you, what you'd most like to share in terms of what I'm going to say, um, I believe you're all modeling this. That's why you're on this call. I, I hold great respect for who you are in the world and what you're up to in terms of changing this conversation and shifting this narrative. Um, so I'll, I'll mix it up just a little bit. I, I'm actually going to ask Maya to start this time around about let's dig in a little deeper and what is, what is the experience you're having right now that you'd like to share a bit about? So anyone, thank you, Char. Um, anyone who knows me uh, knows that I'm a pretty deeply introverted person. So I will often use these kind of platforms to try to uh, highlight the work of somebody else. And uh, this morning, I was listening to Brene Brown's 
podcast and she's just announced that she's going dark for four months. She has 12 million subscribers and she's taking four months off to take care of herself and paying for her team to be off for anywhere from two to four weeks. They get to choose. I find that to be a remarkable example of regenerative leadership in media because I don't think that we see very many leaders who are saying that it is just as important for you to go quiet and to dig deep and to take the time to connect with the land and to connect with your families and to connect with your communities and to be still and to listen. And so I think that is where I am right now in this minute is thinking about the fact that we live in a culture in Turtle Island that constantly says, produce, 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 get the product out, get it out there, produce, produce. And that has infected our storytelling to a degree that it's intimidating now to tell stories because you're almost afraid of what's going to happen after you release the story, the pressure, the uh, performance anxiety, the loss of that connection that you felt to the story and to the land and to the people while you were making the story as a creator. And I, I think that that's a space right now that I'm swimming around in and I'm curious about what other people think about that. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna swing to Naomi because there's a few things that you said that I, I, I know we can relate. We've talked much about balancing the creative and, and you know, creating, producing, creating, you know, and, and, and how do you hold it, hold it to its highest good? curious where it takes you. Yeah, I think um, we're at this moment that's both daunting and exciting in how much is possible that hasn't been possible before um, because of these new technologies, because of where we are as a society. Um, and also we're facing down the Death Star. <laughs> like both of those things are true. So when I say those five corporations, like they are the Death Star, their walls are high, they are slick, there is very few ways in. Um, and one of sort of the central beliefs of my life is that we, as Char said, we have to open up the waterways outside of that system because, um, yes, yeah, so far the problem for the last however long has been that the white men have been in charge of everything and, and intermediating everything between the, the stories and the people, right? But even as that starts to shift, you know, even as the identity of those people begin to shift very, very slowly, It's there's still a group think that's happening. There's still a real disinterest in true, genuinely different perspectives. And so I think we have to find a way to get, to truly get stories at a large scale directly from storytellers to the audiences. Um, so from an ecosystem perspective, that's what I'm always trying to figure out <laughs> um, is how do you do that in a sustainable way? Because the other problem is you can do that right now um, you can put your stuff on YouTube, you can put your stuff on social media, but that's those are extractive models. You are you are doing the labor, you're telling your stories, you're you're building the audiences and the corporations are taking your money, the, the money from that, right? They're they're profiting off your free labor. Um, so that's not that's not actually viable. Right? <laughs> then then we can do it, but we can't, it's not sustainable, we can't make a living. Um, so figuring out a new model by which um, you know. Ma truly masses of storytellers can tell their stories authentically with with the responsibility of choice and, and get them to audiences in sustainable ways like that ecosystem is one of the main things I spend my life trying to figure out. And then within that, it's also, okay, well, as a storyteller myself, looking down the barrel of that responsibility and trying to get that responsibility, what, how do I disentangle my own brain enough from how I've received these stories. I grew, I grew up in the ninety, the you know the the '90s, and I was watching Aaron Brockovich the other day, and I was like, oh my god, this is these are the movies that formed my brain, you know. And like we didn't at the time. You go back and you look at them, and you're going, oh my god, like that's what's all in there. So how do you like 
peel that away enough and begin to ask the question of what are what are stories if we could actually break free of that framework? How do we begin to imagine what stories can exist on the other side? So I guess those are the two boundaries I'm always trying to push, um, both in my own work as a filmmaker and then also sort of trying to push and create these larger systems and create the, the Petri dishes for those larger systems. Thank you. Dee, I'm gonna swing over to you. I'm, I'm curious where this, where this takes you. Um, yeah, such interesting um, answers to these questions. Um, great questions, Char. Um, well, for me right now, as I said, the power of story, power of media in our hands, the way it's really directly affecting me is, of course, I'm, I'm making a film and I'm writing a book on my journey, right? So um, the way that I think it's almost subversive because I chose to do this film on a trail that was built to celebrate Canada's 150th birthday. But I made the film to pay my respects to the ancestors of this land. And I carried the story of all the missing and murdered women in my heart and on the journey with me while I was doing it. That is a subversive act. I've taken something that the government is spending millions of dollars to like get everyone to go rah, 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 let's celebrate 150 years. And I'm saying, no, 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 like there's 12,000 years of story here. And there's this and there's that. That is the power of storytelling is that we... You, we can actually be quite subversive um, and plant new seeds and plant new ideas on the journey. Even the idea of doing an adventure film, you know, I realized there was 15 women that joined me on my journey over the six years who came out to the trail for one week or four. And, you know, those are all the adventure scenes of the film. And so here we have a group of women, indigenous women, with, you know, 15 different women, queer women. And, uh, we get, um, you know, over the, these are, these are not athletes, you know, and yet here we are being the first group of people to do the longest trail in the world while making a film about it. So again, like most of these adventure films are, are all built around the male machismo conquer nature thing. And here we have a bunch of 50 and 60 year old women, you know, going across the country and um, doing it not to conquer nature, but doing it with nature starting like connecting to the physical environment that we're in saying prayers it's all in the process of what we do the journey is totally determined by what we carry in our heart and as women you know we were able that's that's new storytelling showing people how things can be done differently and so i guess for me right now that's what the power of media is in our hands is is, is telling these stories and uh, bringing this subversive element uh, into uh, into it, you know, albeit with comedy and laughter and really beautiful art and sound. And as, as you know, it is, story is medicine. Thank you, Echo, again, for saying that. Um, I really need to get you on as a consultant and work with you on this project um, because story is medicine and that's why we, you know, that's why I suffered for six years. You know, it wasn't, I haven't had a paycheck yet. You know, <laughs> it's like, it really is just about, um, for me, it was about making art about hope and, uh, and changing the narrative. Absolutely. So that's what it is for me right now. Love that. Well, I know that one of the things that um, we've talked about, Catherine, is not not only holding the, the the product, the story itself, but also really being aware of the process. And that's one of the things that I admire about all of you um, is really um, honoring the process of how the story is being made and told and, and unfolding. And Catherine, I'm just curious where, like in, after wrapping up your feature film and, and you know, where from here, where, where does this take you now? What's life and what's the creative projects happening for you now? Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, uh, Dee, I cannot wait to see your movie. Cannot wait. I'm, I'm literally already obsessed with it now. Just yeah. hearing this, and I did the long trail in Vermont. I'm just, I'm obsessed with this now. So um, sidebar. Uh, so I think of myself, as you know, Char, but I think of myself as a um, storyteller first and foremost. Um, and 
meaning that um, I, I really, really believe in the power of story as all of us do clearly and its ability to increase the store of empathy in the world. And I think that it's a, um, a incredible, beautiful way to spend your life. Um, that being said, I have been now involved in many, many, many stories, right? I had the, the, the blessing of being involved in lots of stories, some of which I've generated as a director or writer, and some of which I've just been employed on as an actor or a writer or a director. And um, they don't always get created in the same way. <laughs> and so right now I am um, really obsessed with this idea that I'm calling, which was this, uh, it sort of came to, it was flowering at the time that I met Shar through Naomi at um, Avalon uh, Story Center. Um, but uh, it's this idea that I'm calling collective genius which is for me a dismantling or really an explosion of the, um, the, the lone auteur mythology, right? That idea that there's a single visionary and that single visionary uses the talents and services and crafts and money and resources of all the people around him or her or them to create this single vision that is their vision alone and um, and it's uh, it's extraordinary because it's just theirs, and everything else needs to bow to make that happen, and they need to do whatever it takes to make that happen, no matter what. Um, that does exist; it definitely happens, but it's not the only option, and it's not the world that I want to live in. So either in my creative work or just in society. It's not the leadership that I want. It's not what I want to be. It's not the, the community I want to be in. So collective genius is the um, kind of birthing of the idea that we're all, we all can have genius visit us, which I deeply believe. Um, this is not a unique idea, right? That, that uh, genius isn't necessarily owned. It's something that visits either, you can consider it to be divine. You can consider it to be a glimmer of the imagination. Um, uh, there's Ralph Waldo Emerson had these essays on self-reliance that said that everybody has genius in this glimmer. It's, but those that get named genius are simply those that have the tenacity or resources or opportunity or ego to follow it all the way through to fruition and put their name on it. So what collective genius is, is um, the, the knowledge that we all are capable of genius. And that when we create work, we have the opportunity for all of us to have genius. And if you are in a quote unquote leadership position, which for me at the moment will be directing projects predominantly, when I have that opportunity, rather than leading with my vision, my job is to create a space where my genius can exist and thrive alongside the genius of everyone else that is on that set or in that room with me. And that I need to have the courage to hold the line long enough to allow competing and contradicting and um, seemingly irrevocable ideas to coexist for as long as possible, right? Because you can't make the thing until there's a resolution of that. But you, if, if you can allow them to coexist for as long as possible, then eventually they can morph into something new that none of us could have created on our own, but could only be made collectively. And it's not a negation of individual um, brilliance or point of view. In fact, it's, it's a, I think of it as a deeper, uh, more extraordinary honoring of that because it becomes um, woven with other deeply individual points of view and, and then it becomes something bigger than that. So I'm exploring that um, on projects that I'm now getting hired on to, which is a little bit terrifying because the ecosystem that those projects are being based on is largely the ecosystem that's out there, which doesn't necessarily support that model but I'm trying to use that. I've, I've created kind of a personal lab space uh, called the Empathy Genius Lab. And I'm working with some collaborators on trying to create projects that are genocized out of that idea. And then also I'm just literally using the projects I'm, I'm directing. I'm directing a TV, an independent TV show at the end of the summer. And I'm using that as a lab space for it. And, um, uh, and I'm doing a really personal project that's very much Maya coming out of that impulse of going deep inside, right? Becoming quiet again, and then finding the connection with others through that space, so. 
Love it. I want to dig so much more into the collective genius, but I'm going to hold for a second. Echo, where does this take you in terms of um, the story that's coming through and the life of your work at, at, at present? So many things. <laughs> How, do I, How do I bring it down to just simplify? Uh, so I always have many, many things that are kind of going. That's my creative nature is that it's the creativity is there and it needs to flow out in all of these different ways. And I just trust it as it comes through. Uh, that is that genius or I, you know, divine guidance is what it is to me is my ancestors coming through and saying, hey, here's the little spark, run with it. We will help you spread your wings. Um, the things I've been practicing over the last specifically year or two, in order to stand strong in my medicine and reclaiming the sacred power of storytelling in my own way, through my own medicine tools and technology, uh, I've had to become very, very clear on sacred boundaries. What is aligned with me? What is true to my values? What is true to the land? What represents everything that I'm surrounding myself with in a good way? If it does not align with those things, no. Practice saying no. <laughs> I'm getting better and better at this. Practicing sacred boundaries of like, that doesn't actually align with what my spirit needs or what I'm being called to do right now. Um, I'm going to have to politely decline this request. Um, as we step into that medicine or that divine guidance or that beautiful genius, people see that light, right? They see it and they're attracted to it. Um, and the nature of capitalism um, that stems from colonization is to capture it and make it my own to bring it into my organization, bring it into my project. I want you to come work for me. I want you to come and do this thing for me because your light is going to contribute to my, right? That that single vision, that solo vision. Um, and so I've really been practicing learning how to identify those kinds of projects and whether they feel right to me, they feel aligned or not. The collective co-creation is amazing so so beautiful and it's our body speaks to us right when we are when we are in alignment with someone we'll get like goosebumps or like this um there's this area in the back of our head called our spirit gate and that will kind of like light up and we'll be like oh yeah 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 this is like you're the person i've been searching for for this other project like you have the skills that i don't have <laughs> this is a perfect match um those kind of things i'm starting to notice and show up more for the things where my my whole body is just like yes this is this is your human <laughs> this is one of your humans in this amazing collective that is becoming uh more and more expansive as we are leaning into the things our spirit is saying yes to uh in terms of projects i am in the works of pulling myself away from all of the contracts i had previously said yes to in the practice of sacred boundaries and designing an ecosystem of well being tools for all people in the planet. This is through many different avenues of digital media. This is through in person facilitation. Uh, this is a way of bringing all of my skill sets together uh, to offer things that I know um, I've needed. And in many conversations, have identified that everyone in the planet is seeking some sort of support through healing or land-based connection right now. This is our pathway forward. Uh, so that is one of the babies I've been nurturing uh, and slowly bringing to life. And the other is I'm a performing artist, Sacred, uh, and have stepped into this year as just no longer dimming my light, saying yes to performances and big things that scare me <laughs> as a performing artist. Uh, so I have a solo show on May 18th in Nanaimo where I am again bringing together all of those skill sets, uh, spoken word, music production, songwriting, as well as, as some of the film pieces I've done uh, to bring people through a journey of truths, of hope, 
of history, um, of some really, really strong messaging, but also a pathway forward towards well-being. So those are some things. Thank you. Oh, well, we have about 15 minutes left in, in this conversation. If you're, if you're just joining us now and you're discovering this live conversation, I want to just give it a bit of context again. We are celebrating the official launch of regenimpactmedia.com and really exploring um, Regen and the possibility of what might be possible if we brought together um, both incredible artists with stories that have the potential to heal the human spirit, to shift the narrative and to um, create a new um, feeling, uplifting feeling as our, our reality moving forward, the stories that carry us into the future. Um, what if we brought those stories together with intentional investment, innovative partnerships, um, people that have not been part of this conversation yet, but that are looking to do and be better. What, what might happen if we brought the collective genius together of, of those folks? Um, in the last um, part of this conversation, I really want to dive into um, hope, possibility, and potential. And the way that I'm going to frame that, and for those who know me, you know I'm an eternal optimist. I am the eternal optimist. I was lucky enough to go down to, to Idaho for a, a week last summer. And um, I, I, I came to an experience with the, the belief that media is the medicine we need to heal. Media, I use media interchangeably with storytelling. Stories are the medicine we need to heal. And what I discovered after seven days with incredible storytellers and filmmakers was in order for this to be true, those who make the stories must be healed and whole and healthy. And I think if we're honest about it, a big part of this work is making sure that, that the cast, the crew, the creators, the, the folks that are involved, again, it's like, let's take a look at the root of the problems. Let's take a, the, a look at the root of the possibilities. So if stories are the medicine to heal us moving forward, which I hold as, as such a belief, I can feel it in every fiber of my being, then those who tell the stories also must come from a place of being whole, healthy, healed human beings, or, or in the process of, because I think we, we all are. Um, I'm curious, when you think about the possibility that we have before us as we're walking this new path forward, we're exploring these new, um, this, this new hopeful path forward that's still very much unfolding in front of us, around us, as we continue to be brave about it. I am wondering what your biggest, boldest, brightest vision is of possibility, if you could speak to that, but also what you feel is needed now in order to really make that spark of possibility be fully realized. And I think I'm gonna kick it off this time with Catherine. I'm gonna swing back over to you. What are you most excited about right now in your body and in your bones? I mean, right this minute, I'm just very excited about you guys. <laughs> the people on this panel and Char and Regen. That's what I'm very excited about at this moment in time. Um, and I also loved what you were saying, Char, even just through the course of this panel, I can feel um, that sense of, I felt a huge sense of relief when Maya was talking about um, that going inward, reconnecting with the land, reconnecting with environment. Um, and when Echo was talking about stories medicine and you were talking about stories medicine, we storytellers do have to be healthy. The thing is, is we are all storytellers ultimately, right? There is no person that walks this planet, whether you make your living from it or not, that does not tell stories. It's so much of the way we interact. 
even in the smallest moments, those stories get, even when someone says, how's your day, right? A story gets told in that moment. And um, so, so yes, I agree. I think that the storytellers need to be made healthy, but I think that in that it's all of us ultimately, and it's all the stories we're telling. And so the thing that really excites me is the thought of um, a kind of uh, what I'm sort of calling respectful anarchy in the storytelling world, right? I, I, I hope and believe it is possible to decentralize the power around the, the, the gatekeepers around storytelling. I really do believe that's possible. And I hear it more and more and more in the people that I'm talking to, the strength of doing that and the desire to do it. And then organization, people who have the skills to create those systems um, and who are, you know, synergizing the work that they're doing, like you were talking about Echo or, you know, the, the um, kind of ecosystem work that Naomi's doing and you're doing, Shark, all of that, those, and, and disruption. And I really believe we have the power to do that, to decentralize. And so um, that's the thing that excites me the most. But I think in order to do that, and, and I think in order to do that, we have to increase our appetite for risk. And right now, I think that that's disproportionately falling on the shoulders of creators, I would offer, um, in a way that is detrimental at best and damaging at worst. And I don't mean damaging on a personal level, although that also could be true, but I mean damaging in that we are losing stories. We're losing incredibly valuable voices every single day and i and that's i don't say that from a negative place i say it from a from a place of great uh, wonder what might it be like if we were not losing those stories if there was a place for those voices right and a place for our voices that was sustainable where we could be focusing on the storytelling and that storytelling could be at least in my case the, this thing that i'm so curious about this idea of a sort of almost leaderless environment, right, so to speak, or let's say in the traditional hierarchy and systems that we've created, thinking of things circular, right? What does it look like to be on a film set that functions in circles, that functions in expansion instead of in top down? What does that look like? How do we make that? I, I want a world where we get to focus on that and create that. And there definitely is opportunity right now today but we absolutely have to in increase our appetite for risk. And it's, and it's, and it, it, it has to come from the other storytellers, right? Our audience, audiences are our co-storytellers. There are collaborators, the people that are listening. It has to come from support systems, um, but also from us as well, I suppose. And being in, in a company like this renews my ability to take risks. So I'm very grateful for that. When you think about the possibility, when you think about what is possible, if we can increase our risk and what you are most excited about right now, what, what comes up for you? Well, I'll stick, take a step back and just say that there's always been a paradox for me between the idea of story as medicine and story as sacred and then commercializing that. Because to me, the very process of commercializing the sacred makes it lose its meaning. You've commodified something. That's what we've done to the trees. That's what we're doing to the earth. So too, is it true about our story? So this is a paradox for me, but I think it can start on a most basic level, like Regen, for instance. I notice now with film festivals that they're getting their whole content moving into a streaming platform. So. There is accessibility as a collective group of films to get access to streaming opportunities, even during the festival where people are paying to screen those films, which gets me thinking, okay, the one problem right now with the film festival circuit is, do you know the only person that does not get paid in the film festival circuit is of course the creators of the films. It is the most, I have been saying this for years, this is so exploitive. Why are we paying them to look at our films and then maybe say no. And then even if they run our films, make like I, my last screening of 40 Days at Base Camp sold out three theaters at the Vancouver Film Festival. I did the math. They made $85,000. I got not one penny. This is an exploitive relationship. If we want to start somewhere that is manageable, 
Let's create that film festival that pays the artist a percentage of the theater. Like if you have the wherewithal to get out and do the hustle, then pay you. You deserve at least like the only thing the festival should be keeping. Like then I went out and did my own theatrical. And then I'm like, oh my God, I can rent a theater for one night at 7 p.m. for $300. Okay, like the overhead is not that crazy. We have been exploited. And then like they create this like aura of, of like, oh, I got in this festival. Here's your laurel for your poster. Like I can't eat that laurel. Like what does this laurel mean? You brought this importance to this exploitive situation. So that's where this has to start from ground friggin' zero. And do you know the only film festival that has ever treated that me that way was? The Haida Gwaii Independent Film Festival. They flew me there. They treated me with respect. They paid me. I'm like, you people. And then they got wiped out. They couldn't find the financing to sustain it. They got a grant and it wasn't renewed. But to, so it's not, you know, it, it's the greed is right there. Like that's to me, that's ground zero. And that's some place regen can start. Because if we go out there and we tell filmmakers, we're going to pay you. You're going to make a percentage of the theater. We are going to get the best filmmakers in the world showing up because everybody's getting exploited. So that's my two bits for how we can change this right now. Okay, Maya, where does this where does this take you? It's wide open. Bring it home. <laughs> oh shoot, no, I'm going with this. <laughs> Uh, all right. So number one, I just, uh, I need to read a quote because I think that it resonates for me at this moment um, by the inestimable bell hooks. Uh, when we only name a problem, when we state a complaint without any kind of constructive focus or resolution, we are taking hope away. And in this way, critique becomes just an expression of a profound level of cynicism which frankly works to sustain the, dominated, the dominating culture. And I think D, that this is what we're talking about here. We need cooperative ownership. We need collective bargaining. We need financial antes. We need investors and creators to be working together because the reality is, as you've said, we are creating as our career path. And that means that we are having to deal with the commercialization of an art form, which totally sucks, but it is a reality. And so we have a chance to completely and totally just flip the paradigm where we begin to create a system, a different system that we are building that allows us to think about creators as founders. Because the truth is that founders rarely wind up talking to investors about simply the operational challenges of their business. Instead, they are often looking for somebody to bounce mental, emotional stressors that come along with building the startup. And every new film is a startup. That's how you legally structure it. That's how you financially structure it. That is how you emotionally structure it. So the fact is that storytellers are founders and we need to have multi-layered kinds of conversations we need to have in the weeds discussions of business matters that are detoxified so that we are building decolonized wealth it's really that simple that is how we forge resilient relationships that is how we build strong bonds of trust is when we are working as part of creative teams We've got to stick with the conversation after the creative differences occur. Because if you don't work through those conflicts together without heading for the nearest exit ramp, then you don't build bilateral trust that is healthy. You don't build mentorship and you don't build relational accountability. So the fact of the matter, D, is that I don't even want to just rent the theater for the night. I believe artists should own that real estate. Because that is where you get to take over your creative control. And that is where you get to share your stories with community. Thank you. 
So we're just about out of time, but I want to, I want to um, pass to Echo, and I'm going to ask Naomi to bring us to a close today. Um, I'm Charlene Sinjenko. If this conversation has inspired you, if it's ignited you, I invite you to check out uh, Regen Impact Media to learn more and to connect with us. Um, Echo, I know we're talking about decolonizing filmmaking and storytelling practices um, and where this takes you next. Um, I see a world of industries and organizations centered on well-being. I see generations of seed planters, empowered youth and communities, uh, gender diverse folks sharing gender diverse stories, indigenous people sharing indigenous stories, indigenous peoples leading the way in healing practices for the world, economic reconciliation, healthy people, healthy land, generational healing, an abundance of resources and support for the next generations, cycle breakers and a transition, which is what my current mission is um, from suicide and self-harm as the leading cause of death for indigenous peoples to old age to old age, living old so that those stories can be passed down through those generations. That's my two bets. Thank you so much. I love you. Well, I can't possibly paint a more beautiful vision for the future than Echo just did. So I'll just say what Echo said, and I'm going to talk tactics as to how to get us there. <laughs> so yes, exactly. We, we need a fully different ecosystem. I don't want to get, try to get inside the Death Star and like make it a little bit better. Like for, let's just forget about the Death Star. They're going to like sail off into their own whatever. We need we need a whole new ecosystem that is that focuses well-being, that focuses healing, that focuses stories as medicine, that focuses storytellers as healers. Um, and right now, what's happened to media is essentially what what McDonald's did to food. Right? They have stripped everything that was good about food out of it. <laughs> Both from like a nutritional perspective, from a process perspective, from a harming everyone involved perspective, so that we are so that you can eat a hamburger and still and still be sick, right? Um, meanwhile, these corporations are making phenomenal amounts of money. The same thing has happened to media. Everything that was good about story, everything that, that restored us, has been stripped out of it. Everyone's getting exploited in the process, right? And these corporations are making tons of money. So where I take a lot of hope is that um, the slow foods movement happened, right? And continues to happen. And there was a point in time at which enough people got together and said, hey, you notice how you feel sick with the food you're eating? It's because of the food you're eating. Um, and no, we can't give you a hamburger for 99 cents and have it be nutritional. But if you, if you recognize that in order to heal yourself and in order to, to support everyone involved, you're going to have to pay $3 for a hamburger, maybe we could talk about that. Now, has that movement been fully successful? Of course not. But, but that, that mental transition happened. And then you have to have the systems to meet the people as you help them make that man mental transition. And so I think um, the groups that are willing to build the structures, like Regen Media is willing to build the structure are crucial and we have to give resources to those organizations because unless the the movement shift meets the structures able to hold it it's not going to work you need both of those things um, and that's why groups like regen are so critical yeah. as are you for funding them <laughs> <laughs> thank you all thank you all for your collective genius um, I'm Charlene Sinjeko, and I do hope that you will um, book a conversation. Let's let's talk about this movement. Um, and thank you for being here and your part in today's conversation. <laughs>